reports that were printed by two reporters of the wire and uh, how they had claimed that they could not you know go ahead and uh, verify what was actually printed before it went on print to print i worked in newspaper for a long time hmm. and uh, there's nothing which goes without the consent of the editorial board and without the uh, consent of the uh, editorial desk okay so this need to be verified let 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 police verify this that whether it went without the consent or whether it with, went with the consent once the police investigate we will come to know about it all right uh, mr rp singh thank you so much for joining us on the broadcast so this is the latest that we are breaking for our viewers the searches are currently being carried out at the premises of the editors of the wire the delhi crime branch officers are currently at the houses of siddharth vardaranjan and mk venu we leave it at that up next is plain speak with my colleague shivani welcome everyone thanks a lot for staying with us you're watching plain speak with me shivani gupta the center has come out defending the much maligned citizenship amendment act 2019 with its affidavit filed in the supreme court of india this is in response to multiple pleas filed against the act While the implementation of the act continues to be in limbo the legal battle is finally picking pace after 2 years on the back burner and this legal fight will be critical for the future of this legislation the government's mind has already been known but this affidavit provides legal detailed defense of the act and on every count that the caa was opposed the center has defended it on the question that it is discriminatory that it will lead to influx of foreigners or even the exception made for some areas in the northeast importantly the question that is often asked is if this is about protecting victims of prosecution then why not all victims even muslims from these three islamic neighboring countries to this the center has said that the ca does not seek to recognize or provide answers to any kind of persecution that may be taking place across the world that it is a narrowly tailored legislation seeking to address a specific problem and should not be tested on any other touchstone The CA backlash remember produced some of the most vicious and violent protests in India in recent times. Were these protests premature, misinformed or driven by agenda? These are questions we have continued to debate. And now post the government's firm stance in court we ask these questions again. Where is the scope exactly to oppose the CA? And can there be political consensus on the legislation that is already passed by parliament? I will take these questions to our guests joining us in just a bit but first up let me break down what the center has told the apex court in detail so defense number 1 that the caa is a benign legislation it seeks to provide a relaxation in the nature of amnesty provided and who is that nature of amnesty for specific communities from specified countries in this case pakistan afghanistan bangladesh with a clear cut off date defense number 3 that it tackles a specific problem of persecution on the basis of religion in these theocratic countries we all know there are islamic theocratic countries and it doesn't seek to solve as i said the issue of persecution per se overall defense number 4 it does not impinge upon any existing right prior to the new law a lot of misinformation was spread remember that indian muslims specifically will lose their citizenship because of this law defense number 5 a narrowly tailored legislation seeking to address specific problems 6 It seeks to address the problem that has awaited India's attention for decades. Remember, these refugees that this seeks to give amnesty to have come to India for obvious reasons as their historical motherland and given partition, India has a specific responsibility and duty to these refugees. Defense number 7. In no manner does this affect the legal democratic right of Indian citizens. In fact, it doesn't pertain to Indian citizens at all. The center also goes on to clearly mention that CAA only makes eligible class of foreigners who took shelter in india on or before 31st 12 2014 so that's the clear cut off date those who took shelter due to persecution faced in these three countries on grounds of religion no provision to provide citizenship to such migrants who came after this date of 2014 so caa does not encourage any future influx of foreigners into india is what the center has said the caa applies to past events and has no application in future and it's not like no one else from these countries or other countries will be able to take indian citizenship another misinformation which was spread like the center response states existing regime for obtaining citizenship by foreigners of any country including these three countries is untouched 
So legal migration on the basis of valid documents and visa for whatever reason, including religious persecution, from these three countries, apart from these communities which are non-Islamic minorities in these countries, continues to be permissible. So what's the problem? Who's being barred? Interestingly, the centre also sought to remind the court of limited jurisdiction, quote unquote, here. It said, judicial review in the matter would be very restrictive and limited. And why? It said so, considering wider width of legislative policy and wisdom. In other words, I think the government has gone on to tell the court that this is really the domain of the legislature to make these changes. And if the opposition is that it is unconstitutional in any way, then it has to, of course, been provided for. It has to be explained. So the big question we're asked today is exactly this. The centre is defending the Citizenship Amendment Act in the topmost court of the country. So the question is, can there be a consensus over this law? Because, you know, this is already passed by Parliament and many communities are waiting for it to be implemented. Let me first go across to Abhishek Manu Singhvi, who's the third time sitting MP, Chairman of Parliamentary Standing Committee and an eminent jurist. Manu Singhvi is also one of the petitioners who has challenged CAA in the Supreme Court. Mr. Singhvi, thank a lot, thanks a lot for your time. I begin by asking you, given the government's detailed response on the pleas against CAA, what is the argument according to you to still deem this act unconstitutional? Uh, let me start by saying firstly that precisely because I am one of the lead counsel, I don't really want to discuss the merits in the way you want to because I am a counsel and I don't think it's right for me to discuss it. Uh, we can't have the court battle outside of the court on media. Hmm. Second, uh, today was a housekeeping hearing. It's good of you to try and educate your viewers, but today was a housekeeping hearing. And third, in that housekeeping hearing, it emerged that after months despite a deadline given to the government of India to file appropriate responses on affidavit, they took time and the order so records, having not filed on in, in time. The learned uh, Solicitor General said so. And I think the urgency of the whole matter was appreciated by the bench, which said that they should have filed earlier, but nevertheless now gave time on the 6th of December. Fourthly, without going into the merits in an argumentative sense, let me tell you mm. that... Uh, a lot of issues. See, uh, before that, uh, let me also add that there cannot be this kind of a question. Why can't there be a consensus on the law? Mm -hmm. There is a law passed. Obviously, the law is passed by majority. Obviously, the majority law prevails. It's the law of the land. But equally, you must understand the mechanics and the system. It is under challenge in the court of law. Sure. Now, there's no question of consensus in the court of law because in, in a sense, you'd be suggesting that either we withdraw the challenge or the government changes the bill. No, no, that consensus so that, debate that, is that, for my other guests who will be joining me, politically yes. speaking, after the government's yes. very stated so, response. So that, uh, that, a consensus, as you put it in your question, this will be either upheld by the court, it will be either partially struck down, or it will be wholly struck down, and in that sense modified by the court, depending on what view they take. But now coming to your question on the merits, all I'd like to say is that there are serious issues of constitutional law arising. Right. To give an example, one issue is clearly of classification. Can you classify in a manner which is geographically limited, applies only to a few countries? The Tamilians today raised an issue about Sri Lankan Tamils. How did they? There was an argument today by counsel for the Tamil Nadu government. <clears throat> the, apart from uh, uh, geographical classification, the other is the issue of religious classification. Can you have a law so tailored which draws a line, firstly geographically, excluding some from the line, including some. Similarly, a second line religiously, excluding several religions and giving the benefit to several other religions. Hmm. Now, the test in law is that such lines can be drawn only if there is a very reasonable, very transparent Precisely. nexus with the object sought to be achieved. Now, one object stated by the government is that you have minorities in the stated countries and they comprise mainly Hindus and other similar minorities. But equally, there are large segments which are in other countries, minorities, which are not included. There are Ahmadiyas, there are, uh, you know, uh, other Shia groups, as somebody said about Tamil Nadu. And there are different countries which have suffered on this account, which are not included. So the ultimate bottom line would be for the court to decide whether the geographical line drawn, whether the religious line drawn, bears a reasonable nexus to the object sought to be achieved. Okay. So can and I then come there in? are also issues of uh, Tripura in particular, uh, from Bengal in particular, 
which are a second segment of the case. So I think there's a lot to be dealt with. The government, in fact, has not filed full replies on time. And I think we look forward to the hearing on 6th or shortly thereafter in the hearing. Will yeah. Commence. Well, we do hope that, of course, the legal battle will now pick up pace because everybody wants an end to this matter, as you said. It will be decided one way or the other. But on the issue of classification, I just for the benefit of my viewers do want to mention that the government has quoted Article 6 of the Constitution, uh, which had initially allowed migrants who came into India from Pakistan, including present-day Bangladesh, as citizens uh, till a cut-off date. And even those you know, who had come after six months or had been in resident uh, in India for at least six months before the date of registration, even those citizens were allowed to be deemed Indian citizens. So there is a special class of migrants post-partition which clearly took on the basis of religious lines and create, resulted in large-scale migration on religious lines as citizens of India due to very special circumstances. But I move on. You don't want to, of course, talk about the legal angle here because this is going to be debated in the court. I want to ask you, Abhishek Manu Singh, we fundamentally those opposed to CAA, how will they justify their stand given the hardships religious minorities, particularly Hindus, Sikhs, etc., face in these neighbour countries? And especially when CIA clearly doesn't take away anything else from an Indian citizen, even the other persecuted minorities from the Muslim communities in these countries can come to India on a case-to-case -case basis. You are one of those people who has talked about the plight of Hindus, Sikhs and others in these countries. How do you justify politically, in a civic manner, the opposition to this act? I don't think any of the challenges is to the inclusion of Hindus or other minorities like Sikhs. It is to the exclusion of other groups. Nobody is suggesting that the inclusion of certain minorities in those respective countries is wrong. What we are saying is that that is a partial inclusion. The, the ambit must be expanded. Secondly, the test is not persecution, which might have you no know, valid test, as, for example, refugee law provides. The test is purely religious, only selected minorities in those countries leaving out many, as I said, or the test is purely geographical. There also the boundaries are drawn uh, very arbitrarily. Doesn't the government says that Burma, even if they apply these persecuted religious minorities, there is a process. It's not like willy-nilly it is given to anybody who may come. Absolutely. But this particular amendment, you're right, the amendment uh, gives it in a large sense to those who establish their, their status, but the qualifying condition is merely religion. While but are other Muslims religions. who are religiously or Both otherwise persecuted in these countries on the same plane as other religious minorities like Hindus, Sikhs, Buddhists and others? Are they on the same plane? No, no. no. There, there are, first of all, many minorities, many minorities who claim persecution. I give you two examples. Subsects of Shias, Tamilians, uh, the, the, the Rohingyas. There are so many more. Those are not addressed. I can understand there's a mechanism to say we will address them, but there is a per se exclusion. Secondly, you see, in the name of the CAA, hmm. do you know the actual thing on the ground? Tripura and Assam are two major petitioners hmm. because the actual result on the ground has been actually loss of citizenship. It has been because you are occasionally for political rhetoric or otherwise, but frequently combining it with national registers of, of citizenship. You are excluding large numbers of people who may have been actually settled here. So this is this whole thing comes as a package. Okay. okay. And you can't disentangle the NRC from the CAA or vice versa. I'm not going it's to go into that because I don't have really the government's position on that as far as this affidavit is concerned. But that's really not an argument against the, this act per se. And that brings me You're to right. my final question to you. You You're have right. also said that there is anger, fear and mistrust amongst the people and the centre is responsible for creating such an atmosphere among them. But my question to you is, let's say there are fears over NRC and CAA combined, National Register, etc. plus what you've talked about. There are other ways to address that. Are we not throwing the baby out with the bath water to ask for the CAA itself to be cancelled? On the contrary, I would say that in a functioning democracy of which we are proud, India, in a functioning constitutional system, the most dynamic in the world, in a system where we have very bright and very dynamic judiciary, the correct way is to throw up a legal challenge. That is totally democratic. That is totally constitutional. How can you suggest that there should not even be a challenge? There are people who have grievances. They may lose, they may win. But the ventilation of those grievances by established democratic processes is in fact a catharsis for democracy. 
fair it enough. It is in fact the right outlet for democracy. I have no objections and, to the legal you know, uh, opposition to this case. To try and suppress that or try and prevent that itself would be a outpouring of grievance. So I think the right thing is this. And as a matter of fact, this challenge should have been heard months or years ago. Okay. But now that it is coming up, we should welcome it. Why should you say that let there be a consensus, let the challenge not go on, let the challenge be withdrawn. Let the challenge be thwarted or settled. I'm not saying that the challenge should be withdrawn. Of course, the legal battle should go ahead. We all welcome the fact that it is finally picking pace. But I've run out of time. Abhishek Manu Singhvi, thanks a lot for joining us and sharing your opinion with us. Let's take this to our other guests joining. Anila Singh of the BJP is now joining us. We are expecting a Congress representative soon as well. But I think Abhishek Manu Singhvi has in fact uh, given the viewpoint of the Congress party uh, its state federa uh, association is also one of the petitioners against the case. Ratan Sharda of the RSS and Champa Kalita of the AIUDF General Secretary. Kapil Sankla, a senior Supreme Court lawyer who is joining us. Let me go across to Ratan Sharda first up. You heard what Abhishek Manu Singhvi said. He said that everybody who is religiously persecuted should be allowed entry via CAA. I know that the government has said exactly the opposite and the argument against that also is that everybody is not on the same plane when it comes to giving this very focused, limited amnesty to refugees of a certain religion, persecuted on the basis of religion and who have already come to India till 2014. How do you respond? Because this is the biggest argument that is used, that why not allow all persecution, uh, all people persecuted? Shivani, I have, I have the luxury of not being politically correct. And uh, I do not need to pull punches. India was partitioned on the basis of religion. Dr. Ambedkar at that time had said that there should be exchange of population. Mm. Otherwise, the, pro uh, the problem will remain festering. Mm. Secondly, uh, Nehru Liyakat pact about what? That they will take care of minorities, we will take care of their minorities. It does not happen. True. Now, what is the view of people? I'll be just quote, I'll quote some of the things. I can't quote too much, there's not much of a time. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi in July 16, 47 said, the duty of adjoining province on the side of border will be to accept them with both arms and extend to them all legitimate opportunities. Then he said, poor Hindus who will migrate owing to repression will certainly be accommodated in India. In November 5, Jawala Nehru assured in parliament, there is no doubt of course that those displaced persons who have come to settle in India are bound to have citizenship. If law is inadequate in this respect, the law should be changed. So having an Islamic country of their choice, Today to cry persecution being minority within minority is not acceptable to us because they chose there is huge cost we paid for that particular Islamic to Islamic country, a third one which has become Islamic now. So where do the minorities give? They've been wiped out totally. Yeah. You know what happened in Afghanistan, you know what is happening in Pakistan. Every day there is atrocity news, Bangladesh, every day atrocity news. Where do those people go? So when the partition was a religious ground, when people are being persecuted on religious ground, law will have to be in terms of religion. Secondly, there is second option still available. Have we stopped migration with us? No, sir. The earlier law of granting citizenship is still available. So why are exactly. people saying we have been discriminatory? You know, Third, who are the people of fighting the CA? Congress, TMC, Muslim League, RJD, MIM. Look at the company there. We have electricity for Rohingyas in Delhi, but you don't have electricity for Hindus in Delhi. The same refugees. We had 1 million Hindus rotting in Jammu Kashmir for 70 years because they did not get citizenship there, neither here nor there. And if you look more at people, then there are Gujari Laranda, there was CPM, there was Manmohan Singh, there was Tarun Gogoi. Everybody said that please accommodate our unfortunate uh, unfortunate uh, Hindu refugees. Having said this, why are they going upon that? Law will be tough, law will become difficult. But to add it on to NRC and say this is not right, that is not right. When entire base of persecution of people is on ground of being minority, Hindu, Christian or uh, Sikh, then how can you say your law cannot be minority? So you are saying that if you bring up the case of Ahmadiyas or for example Shia minorities, this? they don't sit this on the is, same plane for them to require Shia a CA-like legislation. Shia Ahmadiyya played a great part in getting India partitioned. Let us not forget it. I have respect for them. I have, I have sympathy for them. But it is like, you know, partitioning of a parent's house, taking another part of the house, they're saying, oh, that house is not good enough. I want to come back. So they no, have to pay the price for the that. The point is Are that even individually, partition, even if from partition, these countries, an Ahmadiyya persecuted individual or a Shia persecuted individual wanted to make India their home, that they have that, the they have, that they option have the is available the to them. It has they have, nobody has been barred. I say this because and when the CA first came out, this was one the of the biggest the things, or possibly a misinformation that was spread, or it was uh, you know people believed it. 
They thought that would be the case, but that isn't the case. Shouldn't we revise our position on CAA? And that's why I talked of consensus. But you mentioned, uh, mentioned the company of the people who have objected to this uh, legislation. Let me bring in Champak Kalita of the AIUDF. The center has all, also gone on to mention very clearly the exceptions that have been made for northeast regions. And they've justified those exceptions because they're saying this is based on historical lessons, etc. What is your objection to the CAA when it hurts nobody in India? Certainly no Indian minority. In English, I will Hindi. Look, there are two things you have to see. One is in national perception and one is in regional perception. The most important thing is the constitutional matter. If it goes to the Supreme Court, it will be the same thing. The most important thing is that the Bharatiya Sangvidhan अलाउ नहीं कर सकता कि भारत में सहरियत मिले सिटीजनशिप मिले उसके लिए क्राइटेरिया रिलीजन हो यह सबसे बड़ी चीज है मतलब ये कभी भी सुप्रीम कोर्ट अलाउ नहीं करेगा आप इसको माइनॉरिटी कर दीजिए कुछ अलग कर दीजिए अलग बात है पर्सिक्यूटेड पीपल कर दीजिए लेकिन भारत में सिटीजनशिप सहरियत मिलने का मैार कभी भी मजहब नहीं हो सकता ये कभी संविधान का जो सबसे बड़ा कोर्ट है वो नहीं मानेगा पहली बात दूसरी बात ये आसाम के लिए अलग है आसाम में आपका 1979 से 1985 तक छह साल एक बहुत बड़ा आंदोलन हुआ और उस आंदोलन को स्टेट इंडियन स्टेट के साथ एक अकॉर्ड हुआ जिसको बोलता है आसाम अकॉर्ड आसाम सुप्ती आसाम समझौता तो इंडियन स्टेट ने आसामीज कम्युनिटी को कमिटमेंट दिया कि ये है आपका डेडलाइन 1971-25 का मार्च से पहले बाद में जो आएगा वो फॉरेनर्स है पहले जो है वो यहाँ रह जाएगा लेकिन ये सीए उस कमिटमेंट को ब्रेक कर रहा है इसीलिए आसाम में इतना रिएक्शन था उस समय अब भी है अब टाइम गया है लेकिन मैं आपको बोलता हूं चीज यही है कि दो चीज एक भारत का संविधान या भारत ऐसा एक स्टेट ने बनना चाहता है कि इसका सिटीजनशिप का मैार रिलीजन हो okay. और दूसरा गवर्नमेंट ने जो आज कोर्ट में बोला है वो ये बोला है कि सिटीजनशिप के जो रूल्स हैं जो एग्जिस्टिंग रूल्स है उसमें कोई बदलाव नहीं है ये एक बहुत नैरो फोकस्ड और लिमिटेड एमनेस्टी है एक सर्टन सेक्शन ऑफ पीपल के लिए और ये पार्टीशन की बहुत स्पेसिफिक हिस्ट्री की वजह से वो क्लास ऑफ माइग्रेंट्स और रेफ्यूजीज इंडिया एक्नॉलेज करती है पार्टीशन के बाद भी एक्नॉलेज किया था और अब भी जरूरत है एटलीस्ट इन द 2014 फोर्टीन कट ऑफ डेट द गवर्नमेंट हैज डिसाइडेड बट आई डू वॉन्ट टू से दर ऑन द इशू ऑफ द नॉर्थ ईस्ट ऑन द एक्ट एग्जेमटिंग स्पेसिफाइड एरियाज ऑफ आसाम मेघालय मिजोराम एंड त्रिपुरा एज इंक्लूडेड द सिक्स शेड्यूल Uh, the government uh, or the inner line as it is mentioned the government has said that these uh, specifications or exclusions have been made on tangible material historical reasons and the already prevalent classifications and cannot be said to be discriminatory but i want to bring in kapil sankla on the prominent point that champak kalita is making that no sub classification even on the basis of religion that grants citizenship retrospectively or otherwise can be made on the basis of religion do you think that opposition alone is going to be heavy on the entire CA Act? I honestly don't think so and I've already spoken about this and I'll tell you why. Because I think the narrative that has been said is incorrect. It does not give citizenship and it does not take away citizenship. What it basically does is to a certain segment of people, it fast tracks citizenship. And that is nothing new. When I mean, you look at it internationally, I mean, imagine this, that there would be a political refugee, any country mm -hmm. will probably fast track citizenship for him. America does it. When you talk about brain drain, you know, highly educated people, mm -hmm. well, certain countries accommodate them, fast track citizenship. When you talk about, for example, people who have the money, they can... Uh, you know, 10 crore or 2 crore or 4 crore, certain countries fast track citizenship. What you're saying is that there are minority refugees who we allow to fast track citizenship looking at the conduct of the country from where they are seeking refuge from. And that's something that every international country all over the world does. I said America does it. It fast tracks citizenship when you're a political refugee. But on the basis or of religion, a because of XYZ reasons, what we said. That's exactly what I'm saying. Hmm. What you're basically saying is that there is a religious minority which is in three or four countries 
should they seek citizenship we can fast track it it does not open up citizenship for them dehors are disconnected from other religious groups it just fast track citizenship and that is the difference so the narrative that is being said that you know the muslims will not get citizenship is incorrect because according to the act the foreign act there is a waiting period of i think 7 years the citizenship is still granted what this just says is that it fast tracks it to i think 5 years or 4 years yeah, or something yeah even like that. that has and become infructuous no couple and that is because the deadline was till 2014 yes you so now i don't and know on exactly, what basis that was it going to be opposed to make. because already these people one have been in india for right. many many and, years and that and that exactly what i'm saying so it actually takes care of past events and not a subsequent act yeah and therefore as you rightly said that even that argument is now infructuous so i really don't know what kind of narrative is sought try is is being sought to be created by the side opposite so can you i ask you can right i ask you a focused well. question the government i think has very uh, yes, importantly please. also reminded the court that listen there is a limited scope of judicial review here and from what i understand you can correct me unless a yes. law can be deemed unconstitutional the courts cannot strike it down in this act what is the scope to prove ca unconstitutional you're absolutely right you see there are four pillars of democracy media is one judiciary executive um, and the, the legislative the the democracy yes the legislative the democratic system is that not only you do not do not have a adventure in encroaching on somebody else's power but you also respect the four the different pillars of democracy hmm. and therefore the government being the legislative having come up with the law unless and until said to be undemocratic cannot be challenged in this case there is nothing undemocratic that has been shown or against the constitution as i said the narrative that is said that the muslims the right of the muslims is being taken away is incorrect it just fast tracks it for a certain minority groups internationally that's it Okay so you don't think there's anything unconstitutional as far as this law is concerned Absolutely not absolutely not I as think Mr Kalita said, wants to come in can I just listen to him for, for 30 seconds then you can respond yes Champak ji Dekhiye madam yahan muslim inclusion muslim ko bhi wahan list mein naam laga wo ye wali baat aayi nahi hai ya yahan baat ye hua hai ki हम ये इंटरनेशनली ये मैसेज नहीं दे सकता है सुप्रीम कोर्ट कि भारत में सिटीजन का क्राइटेरिया रिलीजन है आप उसको अगर चौदह का है तो आप ये एक आयन बनाइए कि चौदह तक जो पर्सिक्यूशन होकर लोग आए हैं उनको हम सिटीजनशिप दे रहे हैं इसमें रिलीजन के, का क्या, क्या काम है इसीलिए ये अनकॉन्स्टिट्यूशन है ये सुप्रीम कोर्ट में इजिली उठ जाएगा अच्छा Uh, I want to go across uh, to our BJP representative. भाषा में रिस्पॉन्ड कर दू हाँ जी कपिल जी बोल दीजिए एक एक लाइन में सिर्फ बोलता हूं मैं इन्हीं की इन्हीं इन्हीं की भाषा में बोलता हूं कि सर पॉलिटिकल रिफ्यूजी आल्सो रिलीजियस रिफ्यूजीज होते हैं अगर किसी देश में पॉलिटिकल कारणों से जैसे पाकिस्तान में हो रहा है और अलग देशों में हो रहा है एक सर्टेन माइनॉरिटी जो वहां की माइनॉरिटी है उसको प्रोसिक्यूट करा जा रहा है तो कोई देश उनको शय दे सकता है हमारा देश भी वही कर रहा है तो इसमें कोई अनकॉन्स्टिट्यूशन या इनिगैलिटी नहीं है सर जब मैं आप बात कर रहे थे तो मैं सुन रहा था आपको मेरी बात सुननी पड़ेगी आई एम सो सॉरी सर वेन आई एम टॉकिंग आई एम टॉकिंग सर दलाउ इंटरव्यू यू कैन गो ऑन एंड ऑन सर बट आई डू दिस प्रोफेशनली एज अ सर जस्ट लेट मी फिनिश तो जब आप एक आदमी को पॉलिटिकल रिफ्यूजी बोलते हो पॉलिटिकली किसी आदमी को या किसी ग्रुप को अगर रिफ्यूज चाहिए तो कोई भी देश अपने दरवाजे उनके लिए खोल सकता है वही हमारा देश भी कर रहा है And also, let's not forget here. Pakistan में चौदह परसेंट से एक परसेंट हो गए हैं। चौदह परसेंट से अगर एक परसेंट हो गए हैं, these are special circumstances. Let's not forget that these were all countries and regions of undivided India. There's a specific history here. We are not doing this for, uh, you know, for Japan or for China or for US or for UK. We have a certain responsibility in the yes. subcontinent. We signed the Liaquat Pact on that. If Pakistan and Bangladesh didn't stand true to their promise, India has the India has the basic motherland of these countries has a responsibility. And the partition also happened on the basis of religion. We would all like to. Chappa ji, one second. Me upar mat bolye. We would all like to live in the utopia where religion doesn't ji. matter. But let's not forget the partition did take place on religious lines. It didn't take place just right. on the geographical right. lines. Please let's accept that reality. I've I've limited time now. Two of my guests have not spoken. Uh, Advocate Mahima 
Chaudhary, uh, Mahima Singh, I beg your pardon, from the Congress has joined us belatedly. I've run out of time mostly on the debate, but I'll give you a couple of minutes. And the larger political question is, uh, Mahima ji, how will the oppos those parties opposed to the CAA justify it to people who are till today being prosecuted, converted, illegally abducted on the basis of their religion in countries like Pakistan? You have a social responsibility here. Uh, Shivani ji, uh, thank you for having me on your show. Apologies uh, for being late. There has been a technical glitch and uh, unfortunately we couldn't help it. Finally, uh, you know, I'm able to contribute here to the debate and your question is apt. And my point here is that uh, no, nobody is opposing, uh, guaranteeing, uh, you know, their fundamental rights to those who, who deserved it rightfully. But then why are we being biased? Uh, does our constitution provide for this bias? Does our constitution justify this bias that we see in this law? There are six communities that the law is providing for. The Citizenship Act 1955 was very clear. It was clear and it had an equal, uh, uh, you know, prejudice or, or it had an, had an equal uh, consequence for all the illegal, uh, illegal migrants. However, the Citizenship Amendment Act uh, that has come now, the 2019 Amendment Act that we see in the current form, uh, provides for six communities from the three countries as the government. But put does, it in don't these also six today. communities However, need greater protection? You're talking about However, bias. Can I just say something? Prejudice is one thing, bias is quite another. Now, there is a bias that exists in these countries against these six communities and members thereof then there obviously will be a bias in the protection and the amnesty these six communities all get. All right, all right, but we're talking about the Indian citizenship uh, and the way it is to be granted to the, the illegal migrants who came to this country before, before 2014. And why, why are we cornering one uh, religion out of that? Aren't those also uh, equally, you know, uh, rightful of giving Because that these state countries are Islamic status, nations. As are the other. I'm saying that why are we, uh, it is it is clear violation of Article 14, Article okay. 19, Article 21, Article 25, Article 29 of the Constitution. Okay, fair enough. Uh, I've run out of time. You joined us a little government. late. I would have liked to delve into this, but I do have to give Anila Singh some opportunity to respond to everything. Anila Singh, you've heard to the opposition that is being made to the CA. It's a long-standing stance of several of the petitioners. They're basically saying that one, there is some sort of an agenda that the BJP has in bringing in this legislation. And it is just, it just goes against the grain of our secular democracy. Ham ye kari nahi sakte ki aap religion ko ek, ek baar banaiye. Ji, my Ram Ram to everyone, better late than never. After all, my turn has come. See, I'm not at all surprised. I'm not at all shocked the way Congress party is behaving in today's day, whether we talk about CA, whether we talk about uh, Article 370, or we uh, talk about Ram Lala uh, Mandir construction. They had stood like wall in between. And every time this wall had been crushed and crashed by Bharti Janta Party or the supporters of people who totally believe that, yes, this is one country, the majority population should have right what is direct. And Bharti Janta Party has all, uh, always stood very strongly with it. Mm -hmm. If we talk about the Congress Party, can they deny this fact? Can they deny this fact that yes, today, like they are saying, that a demographic balance will be constitution ke hai. like in 1947, Indian National Congress in the declaration document, Ghoshna Patra mein inhone Akhand Bharat ki baat kari thi aur Jinnah ne baat kari thi Pakistan ki. Aur aaj, aaj ki sarkar agar ye kehti hai ki Afghanistan se, Bangladesh se, Pakistan se, agar yahaan par Hindu, Sikh, Buddhist, Jain, Parsi, Christian, joh wahaan pe prosecute ho rahe hain, unko hum facilitate karenge, woh Bharat mein aakar apni nagrikta le sakte hain, so they have got a huge problem out of it. Because this is the same political party. If we talk about after partition, those are people who, uh, who, who went into election on the ticket of Muslim League. They won the election and they didn't go to Pakistan. They came to the Congress party. Mein a gay. And Nehru Ji had the Congress party in the Congress party, so that the Hindu and the Hindu in the Congress party had to control them. Okay. So okay. this is the psyche of the Congress party. They are against Hindus. Okay. That uh, is the only I have to leave it at that. This is a classic that. example of twisting the narrative. Classic example of twisting no, the narrative. No, uh, I am shifting the narrative. It's shameful. Shameful. Unconstitutional. Unconstitutional. And becoming of the government of India. Unsecular. No, no, no. Even I am secular. And my party respects all religion. But 
If you are that going to say the yes, that is shown in the conduct of the party. That is shown in the conduct of the ruling party today. It is unconstitutional. It is unbecoming. It is highly unbecoming of a government that the that was given the mandate by the public of this country, trusting that they will protect the fundamental rights of the people of India. Unfortunately, those are the very people that are coming in between the fundamental rights of this country, the constitution, the democracy, and their own. Uh, I think you should go and check your facts, and you should check uh, the history of Indian National Congress Party. 11 October 11th October 1947 जिन्ना सेंस की आबादी आबादी के आधार पे हम जनसंख्या की अदला बदली कर देते हैं 12th October 1947 नेहरू जी वो प्रेस कॉन्फ्रेंस करते हैं और कहते हैं कि नहीं 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 बिल्कुल अदला बदली नहीं होगी क्योंकि पूरे विश्व में हमारी बदनामी हो जाएगी This is what well, I unfortunately I've run out of time ladies I look forward to having you again and I do thank all of our guests but that is exactly the the thing when it comes to CAA. There's a particular history that India shares in this region with countries like Pakistan, present-day Bangladesh, and Afghanistan, even. And can we completely ignore the fact that there are special circumstances involved here when it comes to religious minorities in these countries? I have to leave it at that. Uh, now the legal battle over CAA is going to pick up pace, and we'll continue to debate this further as the hearings happen from next month onwards. From December onwards, in fact. I have to slip into a very short break. On the other side, we're getting the big Twitter debate. Stay with us. Just four days ago, after being closed for about seven months for repair works. Now, NDRF, SDRF, Navy and Air Force teams are currently carrying out rescue operations as we speak. The Chief Minister reached last night he took stock of the entire situation. A ex gratia amount of 2 lakhs has been announced for the kin as we speak. Now, the main reason being blamed by officials is that there were too many people on the bridge itself. But we're going to take a deeper dive through the show as to who and what authorities were responsible. First, take a look at what the Prime Minister had to say just a few minutes ago. I'm Tanagar I'm home. पर मेरा मन मोरबी के पीड़ितों से जुड़ा हुआ है शायद ही जीवन में बहुत कम ऐसी पीड़ा मैंने अनुभव की होगी लेकिन करुणा से भरा मन उन पीड़ित परिवारों के बीच में है हादसे में जिन लोगों को अपना जीवन गवाना पड़ा है मैं उनके परिवारों के प्रति अपनी संवेदना व्यक्त करता हूं दुख की इस घड़ी में सरकार हर तरह से पीड़ित परिवारों के साथ है गुजरात सरकार पूरी शक्ति से कल शाम से ही राहत और बचाव कार्यों में जुटी हुई है केंद्र सरकार की तरफ से भी राज्य सरकार को पूरी मदद दी जा रही है बचाव कार्य में एनडीआरएफ की टीमों को लगाया गया है सेना और वायुसेना भी राहत के काम में जुटी हुई है जिन लोगों का अस्पताल में इलाज चल रहा है वहां भी पूरी मुस्तैदी बरती जा रही है लोगों की दिक्कतें कम से कम हो इसे प्राथमिकता दी जा रही है हादसे की खबर मिलने के बाद ही गुजरात के मुख्यमंत्री सिवान भूपेंद्र भाई रात को ही मोरबी पहुंच गए थे कल से ही वो राहत और बचाव के कार्यों के कमान संभाले हुए हैं राज्य सरकार की तरफ से इस हादसे की जांच के लिए एक कमेटी भी बना दी गई है मैं देश के लोगों को आश्वस्त करता हूं कि राहत और बचाव के कार्यों में कोई कमी नहीं आने दी जाएगी आज राष्ट्रीय एकता दिवस का यह अवसर भी हमें एकजुट होकर 
इस मुश्किल घड़ी का सामना करने कर्तव्य पथ पर बने रहने की प्रेरणा दे रहा है My colleague Siddhant Mishra has been with us live this morning from Morbi where rescue efforts currently continue as we speak. Let's go over to him right now to understand more. Siddhant, I believe you are with rescue officials and divers who are undertaking the rescue operations. I do want to know more about that, but first, could you confirm for us is it correct to say that the Prime Minister has not yet confirmed whether or not he'll be visiting victims in Morbi? Well, yes, uh, he has not confirmed and there is no confirmation from Prime Minister's office. But Toya, right now we are at the epicenter of the collapse. Now behind me you can see uh, this hanging bridge, uh, the debris. Uh, 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 one can see right behind me in my camera. Uh, so this debris has been removed, this, uh, this hanging bridge has been removed with the help of crane. And divers are right now diving in this one patch uh, just to see whether anybody is stuck. Uh, dead or alive so uh, to check that you know divers are jumping uh, into this uh, one patch we'll speak to i am uh, okay fine i am on indian coast guard's boat uh, uh, you know there is very less space on this boat uh, but we are here for our viewers uh, uh, to give a sense that how much uh, indian coast guard is dedicated as far as rescue works are concerned the diver is getting uh, ready he is going to dive in this one patch because crane has removed the debris now they are going to get inside uh, the water and check and remember stagnant water is it's very difficult to carry out rescue operations in stagnant water because it is dirty it is full of garbage let me uh, let me speak sir aapka naam डाइवर मोनू 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 साहब आप पहले भी डाइव करके वापस गए थे फिर आपने हमें अपनी बोट में बैठा है फिर डाइव कर रहे हैं कितना कितना मुश्किल भरा होता है आ, मुश्किल है यहाँ पे विजिबिलिटी कम है हाँ। और यहाँ पे गार्बेज भी ज्यादा है नीचे हाँ। तो डिफिकल्टीज है सी के मुकाबले भी ज्यादा डिफिकल्टीज है सी के मुकाबले लेकिन आप लोग तो प्रोफेशनल है आप इंडियन कोस्ट गार्ड के बेस्ट डाइवर यस बट वी कैन डू यू कैन डू तो अभी आप यहाँ पे डाइव करेंगे और कितनी देर में वापस आएंगे सर आई विल ट्राई माई बेस्ट एंड माई सीनियर विल गिव मी माई गिव माई कमांड एंड Thanks a lot for staying with us. Now it's not been even a week since the world's richest man and Tesla CEO Elon Musk took over Twitter and the shocks keep coming. According to reports now Twitter could begin to charge $20 per month for the verification badges. That's roughly 1600 rupees a month. Reports say Musk plans to charge users $19.99 for the new Twitter Blue subscription. But Twitter accounts that have already are uh, verified will have to comply with this new mechanism and pay for the blue tick the report suggests that verified users will have a total of 90 days to move to twitter blue or they will end up losing their check mark reports also say that twitter engineers have been given a deadline to revamp the twitter verification process elon musk had said himself that the verification process on the platform which adds a blue tick next to the profile name is being revamped and all of this could happen sooner rather than later to charge or not to charge now what could be the arguments on both sides first up for charging one could argue that the move will make the process of getting that blue tick in the first place more transparent right now there are allegations of bias against twitter against it authentication should not be held hostage to financial capability most people may not be able to pay any fees but they do deserve the protection that verification brings with it Similarly now there an argument could be made that if paid twitter will be obligated to give the blue tick to whoever wants a lot of people tended not to because they felt they wouldn't get it now against that one could also argue that high fees will make users drop the very idea of having a blue tick and in fact the blue tick could lose its relevance a lot of people are being critical of this reported idea as a pure greedy means to make money but let's face it twitter does have the right to create its own business model But is this the right time? Remember, global economic climate is pretty harsh and doesn't look conducive to charging for such services which used to be free. People, for example, are dropping their streaming service subscriptions right now globally. Will they seriously play, pay for a blue tick? And finally, some could argue Move could attach a more value, a bigger value to the blue tick than it exists today. But conversely, it can also be argued that it this move could make the blue tick only a status symbol, and that too, especially. for the rich today it is a status symbol for the elite quote unquote but it could be limited to the rich therein 
So that's the big debate that's coming in. Twitter expected to charge $20 per month for the blue tick verification. This is, mind you, not really quoted by them. These are reports that are indicating that. Will Twitterati pay this sum monthly for this batch? Let's go across to the guests who are joining us. Jitain Jain is cyber security expert. Rajneesh Jaswal is general counsel and head of policy of Ku app, which is the Indian social media service app. Abhishek Astana goes by the handle at the rate Gabbar Singh. He has over a million followers. We are expected to join by Sohail Seth as well. Let me begin uh, by with Abhishek. Abhishek, you have 1.4 million followers. You don't have a verification badge. What do you make of this thing? which could make the blue tick worth $20 a month. Do you think something like this will work on Twitter? Uh, see, I guess uh, for any social media, what they do is they try to encourage their power users, basically who, the people who create content, which is seen by millions. Mm. So uh, they, they do it by two methods, basically. One is to give them recognition, uh, some kind of badge, basically, mm. like uh, YouTube has a silver play button, a gold play button, and uh, Facebook, uh, Instagram, and even Twitter had a blue of course hmm. and the second bit is the revenue that they earn from that platform hmm. uh, by in lieu of their followers through brand endorsements or in some cases the platform itself pays them like youtube does now what is happening here is these are the two different strategies or two different incentives to to encourage their power users now there is an intermingling of that now suddenly that that reward or that uh, intangible uh, blue tick has a value now and and that is basically uh, throwing people off uh, imagine uh, if suppose that has a value that has a 20 dollar value attached to it that means the moment i am verified on twitter uh, people might uh, speculate that it's because i have paid money right so yeah. That, that's a difference basically suddenly that that relevance that recognition the value of that recognition mm -hmm. comes down because there is a monetary value attached to it and monetary value is not that great actually thousand rupees a month uh, or 1600 or 1700 bucks a month is not that great an amount to actually exhibit status it's not like i, I have a rolex watch which is worth uh, <laughs> a lakh uh, on my on my wrist which will exhibit status but to pay 1700 bucks a month won't exhibit status anyway so the point is that uh, suddenly there is a monetary value attached to it and uh, the the whole recognition bit might get diluted okay, so okay. that that's my can i ask thing. you a I've simple question though uh, like i said you've got over a million followers but you don't yeah. have a verification tick yeah. will you like to have it or will you uh, pay see, for it at all ever I have made a conscious call not to apply for it because okay. see the thing is verification comes with uh, um, of course uh, revealing your true identity I mean putting up your real name and real picture huh. I, I can't do that because I have a pseudonymous kind of a handle which is yeah. called Gabbar Singh uh, so that was a call which I couldn't take though uh, I I mean meet all the criteria basically like having your name in, in press and uh, maybe a decent number of followers as well okay so I took a conscious call my mind was a different case altogether so I didn't never went for it and what I've realized is it doesn't make a difference as such. I mean, yeah. I have had, I mean, I'm sitting here without a verified tick, right? So it's fine. And I you've guess. got a big following. Another member of the Twitterati that has a big following, over 4 million is Sohail Sage, columnist and author. Sohail, you do have the verification badge. How much Absolutely. is that blue tick worth to you? And do you think people will pay $20 a month, which is 1600 rupees a month for it? I don't know if people will pay. I will certainly not pay because as <laughs> Groucho Marx famously said, I don't want to be a member of any club that will have me. Right. I think it is ridiculous. Elon Musk has lost the plot. You know, this is what happens when your brains are fried in an electric vehicle manufacturing facility. <laughs> as, as Mr. Astana, that's his name, right? As he rightly said, yeah. that uh, it is the people's choice. And frankly, I didn't apply for a blue tick. You know, I got the blue tick. I don't know how. They I mean, gave it to you just like that? Yeah, but in those days, you didn't have to apply. Right. Remember, I'm much older than all of you. <laughs> and I started on Twitter much before you guys did. Yeah. So I didn't ever apply for a blue tick. I haven't applied for a blue tick anywhere. Yeah. And my only issue with Avishay, and rightly so, is, see, there are two kinds of people on Twitter. One who want their anonymity protected, mm -hmm. and the others who don't give a damn about saying what they say. Mm -hmm. I've always belonged to the latter. I really don't give a monkey's uh, you know, hat in terms of, what people think. Now, the blue tick problem is something different. And this is the nub of the issue, Shivani. When the blue tick happens, you will have people who have the money, but not the intellect, the class, or the willingness to be responsible or accountable. Mm. 
So what you're doing is you are making money the denominator rather than intellect or influence. So every Johnny will uh, uh, get a blue tick, which, by the way, makes the blue tick meaningless. Yeah. Elon Musk is a stupid marketing person. I'll tell you why. If you have to make money, make serious money. Then say that the blue tick will be given to thousand influencers in every country. Mm. For the rest, I will charge a thousand dollars a month. Wow. Sometimes, sometimes no, no. I'll tell you why, Shivani. Sometimes fees are a very good segregator and separating from the uh, separating the wheat from the chaff. Then people who are serious about Twitter will apply. I mean, if Abhishek, as he rightly said, and and I loved his comment about how Twitter needs to get revenues, you know, advertising branding, co-branding, promotions. Mm. That will only happen when you have people who can afford to uh, have it. There is no point me selling a product uh, to Sohail Seth who doesn't have the money to afford it. Can I just come in? You mentioned the blue tick, you know, uh, first of all, right now there's a process where you have to show that your account is authentic, notable and active. You have to give references of your work. You have to provide a picture, uh, a valid official government ID. And yeah. your profile should have a profile name, it should have a profile image, and it must be active at the time that you have applied. So all of these are things, the reason why, for example, I have a blue tick because I have, uh, you know, my publications, etc. And I'm, I'm using my identity, etc. to, uh, uh, you know, to function on Twitter. But I want to ask Jitin Jen, you know, what, twi what we understand from remotes, uh, reports is that there is still a roundabout way of getting people to pay for the blue tick. Actually, the subscription will be for Twitter blue. But reports suggest that you will end up paying for your blue tick also because it seems like they want only verified people to be on Twitter blue and then uh, continue to pay for that subscription if you want to keep your verification, which is a uh, elite status symbol on Twitter. Do you think something like this will work? Because as one Twitter user said, either you create an elite community where only verified individuals who have the money will interact with each other, but then what's the fun of Twitter then? The very fun of Twitter is that everybody is on the same plane. Or you give some additional benefits like edit button, etc. But will you pay $20 a month for that? Where do you stand, Jute? You know, I think I agree with Sohail, but, uh, you know, partially. Because I don't think Ellen's mind is fried in an electric car factory. I think he's trying to make money out of a cactus. So, <laughs> you see, there is no doubt that Twitter needs to commercialize. Twitter needs to make money in order to be sustainable. Unless... They are willing to go on a Facebook and uh, Instagram route where they're just catching eye calls by just, you know, pushing random content, selling data to people, you know, just throwing garbage and turning entire social media into a political hate house. So I think if he has to keep Twitter healthy, informative, a town square, as he's likely talking about, then he has to commercialize. And that commercialization angle can only come from additional services. So as far as Twitter glue services like, you know, edit button, or, you know, uh, deleting a tweet or, you know, uh, some other premium services are concerned, additional characters or say additional space for videos is concerned, I think people will buy. Uh, I, I was have been suggesting from last four or five months that Twitter needs to sell commercial services to political parties, which has turned Twitter into a political, uh, you know, a hate machine. He needs to sell Twitter to corporates who are using Twitter to make money to influencers. But so far as ordinary users or intellectuals are concerned, you have to have some sort of differentiation there. So I think what Elon Musk is doing, he's setting the world on a wild goose chase. He's trying to test waters, how much a society will pay, what will be the reaction. I think it may so turn out that he will he will sell verification in, as a part of Twitter view, but that verification might be an orange stick or a dark blue or a light blue tick, maybe something different. So you don't know what he's trying to attempt. Of course, he's going to make money. He's going to make money by commercial services, but at the same time, I agree with Sohail that he will. He's going to ensure that his intellectual rot, which actually uh, lot, which actually keeps the Twitter going and Twitter a lively place, doesn't go away, doesn't walk away. No, I and think also, it is not the intellectual. Uh, uh, it is not the intellectual heft of people on Twitter which makes people uh, Twitter Twitter. It is the no, fact that an intellectual a and a commoner positive. is on the same plane on Twitter, and you and I can say anything that anybody else can say and no, get opinion yeah. going. It is we not an intellectual sphere. Shivani is missing a very critical sphere. point. Yeah. Suppose, suppose if Narendra Modi system. refuses to pay for Twitter Blue and his Blue Tick is taken away Twitter. and then random 20 idiots make Narendra Modi account and start tweeting some bullshit rumors about currency, about market manipulation, yeah, or yeah. anything. What will happen? 
So there will be a general raj of rumors running around. So verification has also helped identify genuine people. No, that's precisely why I mentioned that verification cannot be held hostage to your financial capability. Absolutely. The very issue of verification is that it allows you protection from somebody. Aping you or somebody copying your identity? Yes, you. So, Hale, you were saying something. I have to let go to Mr. Jaswal also. <clears throat> let me tell you. By and large, Twitter is the most chaotic, loudest, stupidest platform. Yeah. On uh, on the in the digital world, I'll tell you why. It allows people to say stupid things and get away with it because of either anonymity or because no one else cares. It is not a responsible platform. So, if Elon Musk's objectives are to change the definition of the platform, make it more responsible, you can't do it. Because then all these uh, uh, left liberals will scream saying, oh, democracy is being taken away from uh, Twitter and you'll have an army of people abusing him. I think Elon Musk is just trying to make himself relevant. But I, if I were him, he should concentrate more on Tesla and less on Twitter. Okay. Because sometimes when you sleep on the wall, your businesses do better. All right. We all have an opinion on Elon Musk, isn't it? He's certainly a maverick, but the man continues to be in the news. Rajni Jashwal, I'm giving you the final word. You come from Koo app and of course your aim would be to expand Koo and its subscriber base. Do you feel one that if Twitter was to bring in this charge for verification tick, you could actually get migration to Koo? You would answer that second. But the, my first question to you is the very use of verification is so that people cannot steal identity or cannot create that chaos. Like uh, Jitain was mentioning, uh, if you know so many uh, Narendra Modi accounts came up and they possibly exist, but viewer, uh, uh, somebody who's a reader knows which Narendra Modi account is verified and what to believe in. So, what do you make of this report that Twitter could charge for a service like that? Should it do so? Do you think? And could Ku benefit if it does so? I think I'll answer the benefit part later and first uh, talk about what Ku does. Um, who believes that regardless of eminence or whether you're a big person or a small social media entity or anyone else, uh, every individual and every citizen has the right to express themselves and showcase the genuinity of their identity. In fact, in India, it is a legal right. Mm. Under the intermediary guidelines last year, the government had prescribed that social media entities should allow for verification yeah. of users. Uh, who launched a self-verification feature last year uh, where we gave a green tick for anybody who verified their identity. And then on top of that, we have something known as the eminent stick, which is the yellow tick. Mm. Uh, so if you are an awesome Indian personality like the folks on, on screen today, uh, who will give you a yellow tick? Yellow tick means that you're a person who's done something <coughs> of um, a sense of something great in the Indian um, in the Indian scenario. Okay. And that people can find you and that people are able to connect with you. And that goes back to the question that you asked. When you give a yellow tick, uh, you are letting other users know that this is a person who has something to talk about. This is a person who's done something well and has an opinion to share. Please follow them. At Ku, all of the, this is done without any charge, whether it is the green tick or the yellow tick. Uh, these verification processes are designed to ensure authentic users connect with each other and have access to eminent personalities and understand their thoughts and views. Mm. So from a Ku perspective, I think charging or not charging is secondary. The first thing to do is connect individuals, connect Indians to each other, and showcase eminent Indians to other Indians as well. Um, whether folks will migrate or not, that is for them to decide. Uh, but we are we are we are very keen on our mission to bring inclusivity, uh, and inclusivity doesn't have a cost. I mean, it it should be free of charge. I get your point. I think that's exactly the bottom line. Jitin, I'll give you a final word. I think if Twitter was to charge for a verification tick, even though it will be disguised as a Twitter Blue subscription but it will have a rider that you could lose your verification if you don't comply. Uh, I think it will be the first of a kind where a social media platform is charging for a service like this. Do you think we are moving in that direction? That just no, globally speaking, the uh, online space will become this? Shivani, India is the capital happen. of freedom fighters. They fight for anything that's free. No one is going to pay. Okay, okay. Uh, let's oh, but I'll, be, I'll be very surprised to see if Elon Musk can dig out $20 from Suhail said. But anyways, uh, you know, on a senior side, I think I don't think Elon Musk would like to get into confrontation in multiple countries. For example, removing blue ticks of head of the states, which obviously will not pay. There is no way that government of India is going to pay twenty dollars per month. Okay. Imagine a a, a a news publication like CNN, IBN Group having two thousand odd journalists. If you were to pay twenty dollars every month for seventy hundred two thousand journalists, you will be end up paying five crores every year. Yeah. It's impossible. The five CR, uh, you know, people will better be given a salary hike. 
<laughs> so I don't think, first of all, this twenty dollars amount will be you know imposed upon existing in intellectuals because they will definitely not pay. Nobody pays for the gratification of the in in you know intellect or uh, you know. Some no, I think award. people will like, pay. You know, I think Twitter people love to pay for the gratification money. of their intellect. <laughs> We would love to do that. Yeah. Yes, Soil. But Shivani, being a great anchor that you are, why don't you start a campaign where Elon Musk pays us to be on his platform? Yeah, I think that's a good Musk. idea. Two hundred percent, maybe two hundred anyway. dollars per month. <laughs> you, YouTube anyway does that, right? They yeah. pay you for creating content. Yeah. So uh, Twitter is charging you to be a super creator. Imagine. So I think uh, if I took a poll, I think most of you believe that this, if this idea comes into being, it would be a flop. Can I say <laughs> get a yay or a nay? I mean, Netflix no, no, learned that lesson after three years. There will be many who will pay. Twitter will learn it too. Okay, I think uh, let's, let, let's, let's just hope, wait and see. As long as Uber does not turn into a you know bloodshed. Sorry, uh, Jitain, come again. Uh, let's hope that a bluebird does not turn into a you know bloodshed. Okay. All right. I, I request gentlemen not to use words like that, uh, just for my safety also. But anyways, this was a good discussion. I think in the days to come, as long as Elon Musk is at the helm as chief twit of Twitter, we're going to have very interesting days ahead. How as a user it will affect your life, we don't quite just know yet. This could just be an idea that is being debated. It may not come true. But if it does, it will change the engagement on Twitter by quite a bit. Thanks a lot to all of the guests for joining us. And thanks a lot for our viewers for tuning in. Namaste and welcome to this edition of The Right Stand. I'm Anand Narsimhan. Ladies and gentlemen, at the outset, festive greetings, compliments of the season and more importantly, thank you. Thank you for your sustained viewership, your trust, your patronage on the News 18 network and at CNN News 18. We have consistently been able to perform, outperform all our competition. Thank you for your viewership. It is your trust that allows us to bring to you the stories, the debates, the way 